This is Tom Renacki and today I'm going over ball of the foot pain and metatarsalgia pain. So this is my, so I'm gonna go over all the different types of ball of the foot pain, how to take care of them, how to diagnose them, all the fun imaging and the new treatments, the new shoes, everything that's available out there. Metatarsalgia, this is a common condition that causes pain and inflammation in the ball of the foot. It's often due to overuse, high impact sports, or poorly fitting shoes. There's a lot of different causes, but basically the ball of your foot gets sore. This is very common in people who stand all day on hard surfaces, on concrete, high impact sports activities, high arched feet, or even flat feet, or even a normal foot that's overused. The second toe is very common, nerves that get swollen, capsulitis, tendons in that area, even plantar fasciitis in the front of the foot. It's more likely with certain shoe types. It's more likely with heavier weight. It's more likely with more activity. And with aging, we have less of a fat pad underneath the ball of the foot. Now I'll skip ahead on this one. I did a deep dive into all the different therapies on the fat pad. There are some grafts you can put in there. There's injections, but the studies are not great. I don't really know of anyone doing this practically. One of my colleagues in Philadelphia did a plastic surgery rotation where they tried to inject fat into the ball of the foot and he told me it did not work well at all. So there, we'll look at some other solutions there. One easy way to look at metatarsalgia is x-rays. You can see if there's any fractures. Stress fractures are very common as well. And I love to use the ultrasound to take a look as well. Are the capsules swollen and thick? Are the tendons swollen and thick? Is the plantar fascia throughout the middle of the foot going to the front of the foot swollen and thick? This is definitely possible. And if there's some suggestion, something might be going on, an MRI might be possible. Number two, Morton's neuroma. This is a painful condition that affects the ball of the foot. It's usually between the third and fourth. A lot of people get this, but there's a lot of tricks to it. The thing is, in Morton's neuroma, is not like a tumor. It's not like a cancer. So that name neuroma is not really true. There's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of wrong things that people are doing to treat this disease. So let's go over the symptoms first. The 10 signs that you may have a Morton's neuroma. The Morton's neuroma is a term that refers to the thickening of the nerves in the tissue right here. It can cause sharp shooting zapping pain. The pain usually worsens with a lot of activity. So as you're running and your foot's pressing, you're going to have more pain. Numbness, tingling. Do you have numbness in the ball of your foot? Sometimes a crushed swollen nerve such as a Morton's neuroma can cause that. Do you feel like there's a lump or a pebble in your toe specifically between the second, third, fourth toes? That can happen on the bottom of the foot. Do you have pain relief when you remove your shoe and massage the ball of the foot area? Do you have pain that's often described as burning, cramping, pain that may radiate into the toes? When you wear high heeled shoes or heeled shoes or shoes without a lot of cushion in the front, do you get more pain and tenderness? Pain that is localized between the third and the fourth toes. Those are the 10 signs of a Morton's neuroma. Another thing I hear is it feels like my like socks are being bunched up in the ball of my foot, but it's not actually getting bunched up. So the causes of a Morton's neuroma, the primary factors are the foot structure. People with a high arched foot or a flat foot are more likely to get it than people with a neutral foot. High arched foot actually puts more of an angle on the front of the foot, whereas a flat foot, as your feet flatten out and you walk forward, you lean into it. As you lean into it more, even though you don't have a flatter foot, you're leaning and it's bruising up that nerve. That's called excessive overpronation and puts pressure. People with certain types, especially women who wear high heel shoes, narrow shoes, it's more likely to happen in women, but it also happens a lot in men with dress shoes, because we, hey, we guys wear heels too. You know, a one inch heel in a dress shoe, like an Oxford shoe, or if you stand on your feet a lot, if you have tight hamstrings, glutes, calf muscles, if you have repetitive stress, if you're in an activity where you're standing, like running, dancing, jobs that require, you know, standing on hard concrete, like a janitor, or working at one of the auto plants here in the Detroit area. So take a look at this pressure map in shoes. The left foot is the much tighter foot, and look at that red spot. That's exactly where the pressure develops the neuroma. These feet in the middle have it more under the big toe joint pain. So they're gonna have bunion, big toe joint pain, but these two feet on the right, you can see, 
both balls of the feet have pressure where the neuroma is. And hey, look at this person develops neuroma pain in exactly that spot. And when I look at this under an ultrasound, you can see at the top is the skin. As you go down about a centimeter, you have the two bones in between the third and the second bone in this case is a neuroma. So this is not your standard third inner space Morton's neuroma, but this is a second inner space neuroma. What about injury and trauma? If you had a previous sprain, fracture that changed the biomechanics, if you hurt your knee, your hip, you're going to lean into the front of your foot more and get problems. Genetics. Genetics can also do it. So if your mom and dad had it, you are more likely to have it, especially if you have bunions, hammer toes, bunionette pain, and age. As you tend to get older, you get less flexible, you have less fat pad on the ball of your a loss of fat pad in the ball of your foot with age, it's going to put more pressure on those nerves. And gender, I kind of mentioned this but women, especially because they wear usually less supportive shoes and narrow shoes contribute. Occupational factors, I kind of mentioned that overuse so sports activity combined with that footwear, that's the cause. So what do you do? Are tests that you can do? There's something called a molder's click. If I squeeze the front of the foot together while pressing with my other hand in between the third and fourth toe, I can actually feel that nerve popping up and down. That's called a molder's click. I can do this even before imaging with patients. I can do that molder's click and while I squeeze the foot together and move it up and down, I can feel that fat swollen nerve move up and down. Now the nerve should normally be like one millimeter or less. It's like 0.5 millimeters to one millimeter. Swollen painful neuromas can be as big as 22 centimeters all the way through. In the office, I love to use the ultrasound, especially in cases where people are frustrated. They're like, hey, you don't know what you're doing. It's not getting better. And they start to lose trust in you and they want to do something more radical or expensive. It's easy to show them on the ultrasound, but the reality is it's never really that big. It's usually regular size or a little bit swollen. It can basically come up above the bone and below the bone. Studies do show that usually the more swollen the nerve is, the harder it is to get better. But even small thin nerves can have a lot of pain. Another one is the Sullivan sign. So I think of, uh, you know, I can't do it with my hand. The live long and prosper thing that Spock does, I can't quite do it. But a Sullivan sign is exactly like that. The toes spread out to the sides because the nerve is too fat and swollen in between the toes down here. A lot of times the Mulder's click and Sullivan sign are ways to look at it. Is there spurs? Is there broken bones? Do you have a stress fracture? Because a lot of the times when people come in looking for a Morton's neuroma, it could be capsulitis, could be a hammer toe, could be a stress fracture, and you want to treat these. We want to get an x-ray, even though the x-ray doesn't see soft tissue to see, hey, is a bone broken? Is there a stress fracture? Is there damage? We want to definitely check that out. And number two, we want to check for swelling in the ball of the foot. That's where I would use an ultrasound. In the office, I would put some gel on it, I would use an ultrasound, and I actually check for that swelling and that thickness through there. Now this is a very prominent neuroma between the metatarsal heads. It's poking out between the metatarsals. You can really see it. But in most cases, it's not as swollen as this. I just use this for effect. But what you can see when you compare the left foot versus the right foot, you can see that there's noticeable swelling on one side compared to the other. And you can show that to the patient. It really raises their confidence in you as a practitioner. I personally find this in my practice, but when you ultrasound certain areas, you can see specifically, hey, is the second metatarsal head swollen? Is the third metatarsal head swollen? Sometimes it's referred pain. Sometimes the tendon is swollen. And you can show the patient this real time. They are so confident at that point. And they don't make those panic decisions like, hey, go see a second guy. Maybe my guy doesn't know what he's talking about or gal. So that really raises the confidence in your patients. And that's something you can offer in the office that necessarily they can't be doing at home. And not just for the patient, but for you, you feel really good when you make recommendations to patients, you are confident. When I check for that swelling in the ball of the foot, I actually measure it. Is it more than one millimeter? Is it six millimeters? I usually find it's usually like two, three, four, five millimeters. And the ultrasound, not only does it diagnose it, but it helps us with treatment. There is a study in 2019 that basically showed if the neuroma is over five millimeters, it's less likely to get better with things like injections and therapy, and it can take longer to get better. If there's still concern, 
we could order it. An MRI is much more accurate than an ultrasound, even though for my purposes, because you can do it real time, the ultrasound is very effective. In the office, I do the ultrasound really quick. We'll do the x-ray to rule out joint fracture. An MRI gives you a much better image. Take a look at that neuroma. You can see it pretty clearly there, but it is more expensive. You usually have to go through pre-authorizations. An ultrasound you can do in the office pretty quickly and easily. Look at that nice image. And then we can look at the size too. The size predicts how long the neuroma will take to get better. Now, peripheral neuropathy is your nerve sensation in your toes is not as good. That's something we want to look at. And that includes nerve conduction velocity studies. We can look at nerve conduction velocity, but this is a more advanced test. We rarely need to do this. An easy thing that I like to do is something called a diagnostic injection. This can both be a treatment and a diagnosis. If we're confused whether this is the treatment or not, I use my ultrasound to find that neuroma and we put a little bit of numbing medication down there. If all your pain goes away with that numbing medication, it's probably the neuroma. But if it's not, it might be something in your ankle, in your back, it might be a different problem. This can be a real benefit in diagnosing it if it's not getting better. So in this particular study, they looked at 121 patients and the ones who were five millimeters or bigger were the 21 cases who did not respond well to conservative and injection therapy, something to think about. Let's get into the treatments for a Morton's neuroma. Number one, injections can be really good. I like to use an injection right away because this is a diagnostic tool. It tells us whether we're wasting our time treating the neuroma or if it might be something else. So for example, if it's a stress fracture and you have a lot of pain, putting a little bit of anesthetic in the front of the toe will not make all your pain go away. But with an aroma, it can make that pain go away. At that point, we might as well just put some steroid in it that'll cool down the neuroma. We'll see how much of the pain goes. An injection can work really well. There are other injection types. There is there is PRP, which is platelet recombinant plasma. There is Botox injections. There's also stem cell injections. I usually keep it easy. We go with the lidocaine, which is the numbing medication and the steroid that usually calms it down. Now surgery. Who needs surgical therapy? If you go through months and months of doing all this stuff and it's not working, in my opinion, it works almost all the time. But if it's not, there's two major types of surgery. There's basically injection or ablation. You can inject a series of alcohol injections into the neuroma site. This essentially kills the nerve. Studies can be very beneficial. I don't really do this because it's a lot of visits, a lot of injections. In ablation therapy, you can essentially use a radio frequency wand to burn and kill the nerve. Another one is decompression. You can cut the ligament between your two knuckles so that there's more room for the nerve to move up and down or you can excise the nerve. Now, these work well because they cut out the nerve. If the nerve's cut out, then you're gonna do well. The success rate's like 90 plus percent over a 10 year period. If you're like, hey, I'm out of options, nothing's working, surgery is a decent shot. The problem is you're cutting out the nerve. You're not really fixing the biomechanics. There's two types of incisions. You can go through the bottom. I don't like doing this because it leaves a wound on the bottom of your foot and you can't walk for at least like a month comfortably, probably even more as it heals. But essentially you go in there and you cut out the nerve. Probably the more common way to do it, and this is how I've always done it, is you locate the nerve from the top and you essentially make an incision from the top. You would transect the nerve. You could even coat the nerve. And there's another way to do it. I don't necessarily do this way. I've heard of a lot of people just going in there and cutting out what's called the transect transverse ligament, that leaves the neuroma. If that's the case and it gets better, then why not just get pressure off there in the first place? That's why I always focus on the orthotic anyway. It just makes more sense to me. What I see a lot of is a lot of people coming in for second, third opinions, and it's sad, but when somebody has a surgery, what do you do then? A second surgery? And what if that doesn't work? Essentially, what I do at that point is you have to focus on conservative treatments. Do you do a third surgery at this point? I actually spent some time in Chicago with Dr. Eduardo Rodriguez, who is phenomenal. And what he does, he actually uses like a nerve graft or a nerve tube to coat the stump. And essentially he wraps it, puts a couple sutures around it. It's a great technique and I've done it a couple times. So essentially in second, third procedures where nerve pain is not going away, what Dr. Rodriguez would usually do is you cover it with a nerve conduit or a nerve graft. There's a lot of different companies. In this case, it shows both ends of the nerves. Pretend that distal portion is not there. But essentially what you do is you come in with scissors, 
you cut the tip of the graft so there's an open canal that that nerve can grow into. Now the inside of that nerve graft is porous, it's soft, there's nothing really that irritates the nerve. So it lets that freshened up nerve ending grow into the graft. So you cut the tip of the graft, you trim the tip of the nerve, and then you essentially just take some suture and you suture up the tip of the conduit there. And that has worked well. I've only done that a few times that I've needed to do it because the vast majority of the time you can get away with more conservative treatments. And I'm going to go over that. But Dr. Rodriguez has a lot of success for even a posterior tibial nerve. I had a patient that was on workers comp and he stepped on a pipe. So he did this technique for the posterior tibial nerve. So he's done some impressive things, but for the neuroma, I think you can get a lot of pressure off there, but this is the way out if it's not getting better after a long time. But essentially what's worked even better for me is using great orthotics to offload it, addressing the ankle joint equinus, the hamstring, the knee tightness, and even using conservative care therapies like shockwave therapy works unbelievably well. The laser, so there's the MLS laser, there's a couple different lasers out there, and the occasional injection at this point. You have to really convince the patient, that's kind of where the ultrasound can come in and help out by actually imaging this and really getting them on board and convincing it. At the same time, if I did a surgery like this, I have had some great doctors help me. There's nothing wrong with having another person take a look, write some chart notes at really what's going on, what happens, really work together as a team and back each other up in these regards. But hey, this isn't supposed to be a surgical treatment guide. This is a conservative guide. And you know what? That's what I am going to focus on. Because really, where you really need conservative therapy is if you have those cases that are stubborn, not getting better. Now, you could have used it in the first place, but there's always that pressure. Hey, the patient wants something done. You see these surgeries with the stump neuromas, and people are in pain. They're on chronic disability. They're on workers' comp. So what do you do in these cases? Now, this was a pretty powerful meta-analysis. It looked at 25 studies and it compared the different types of conservative therapies. They ruled out ones with small numbers and for various different criteria, but they essentially found that using, they found that using shockwave therapy and corticosteroids were both effective treatments. They weren't number one, but steroids worked really well. Diagnostic injections worked really well. Shockwave therapy worked really well. Other studies they found did not work overly well as conservative care therapies, but what was number one is actually addressing the biomechanics, the ankle joint equinus, massaging the area, massaging the plantar fascia, using orthotics to get pressure off of it. And they found that these treatments overall were over three times more effective than all of these other conservative treatments. So you can use them all, mixing it all up. There's no reason you can't use all of these. Personally, I always focus on the orthotics and something that reduces the pain. For me, that works extremely well, even for resistant cases. I mean, people who have had two, three surgeries, people with diabetes that have lots of problems, these are safe low risk, great treatments. And next, this brings us to plantar fasciitis and ankle joint equinus. Plantar fasciitis, most people don't think about this as a four foot problem, but sometimes when I look at people's foot with an ultrasound in the office, I like to measure the thickness of the plantar fascia. And what happens is when you lift the big toe or the toes, that plantar fascia gets tight and that's actually what's sore. And when you measure the thickness of the plantar fascia, Normally it should be between like four to five millimeters, but if it's like four to eight millimeters, you can see some thickness, some swelling, it's inflamed, it's irritated. Plantar fasciitis is not just at the heel. It could be throughout the midfoot or going into the forefoot. Don't discount plantar fasciitis as a cause of ball of the foot pain. So on the ultrasound, for example, if you can't engage the windlass mechanism like so, how are you going to get pressure off the ball of the foot if it's stiff, if it's tight? Now on the ultrasound, it should be about 30 to 40 millimeters, but if it's like 80 millimeters, it's swollen and it's not going to be flexible. So to take that a step further, I will actually start at the heel and go through the midfoot and the ball of the foot. Sometimes where it says C there, you will see that it's thickened. Sometimes there's plantar fibromas. Sometimes you can't bend the toes up because that tissue is just so swollen and sore. Sometimes that's where massage 
shockwave therapy, the laser, offloading with a metatarsal pad, right away you can measure those differences. And I show the patients like, hey, this is really shrinking down. They just feel so confident, so happy with their metatarsalgia improving. And I won't get into all the details about plantar fasciitis. I could go on about that forever. And this is more likely to happen with a tight Achilles tendon, tight calf muscles, tight hamstring, tight knee. And when you're looking at the biomechanics more, that includes not just the plantar fascia, but the Achilles tendon as well. So one of the things is we looked at that meta-analysis and working at our functional correction. So that's our orthotics, our stretching, getting that ligament thickness down. That is by far the most successful thing. If we just keep injecting these problems like the capsulitis, like the neuroma, it's not going to provide that long-term fix. In fact, even the surgery, like cutting out the nerve, even though it's great and these are very successful surgeries, why not do this extra stuff at the same time? That's us as podiatrists. That's what makes us so successful, I think, and what really gets patients raving about us. So essentially, you can see on the left-hand side, when you have an inflamed tendon, when you have an exostosis, that is going to be an inflexible inflamed Achilles tendon. So with your diabetes, for example, on the left-hand side, it's going to be thicker. It's going to be glycosylated. It's not going to be flexible. But as you do these treatments, so like our massage, our stretching, our strengthening, our orthotics, the inflammation clearly comes down. And you can measure before and after for the patient. They're extremely happy. Their Achilles tendonitis, their ankle joint equinus actually improves. Their foot pain does a whole lot better. I think this is just a great way to go. And that doesn't mean you can't do any of those great treatments that you're already doing. This is just some additional stuff that should be looked at in case you're in a jam. Take care of that ankle joint equinus. And there's so many ligaments, even just beyond the Achilles tendon, beyond the plantar fascia. You could look at pretty much all the tendons and anatomy of the foot and ankle and do this. Adaption is very important. Ligaments connect bone to bone and tendons connect muscle to bone. This is a very important chart. Your nerves, your muscles, your bone, and your fascia adapt very quickly. Within about the first 30 days, those start to adapt. So you start to feel better when you start a workout program, when you start wearing shoes, when you start wearing orthotics, but your ligaments your tendons, and your cartilage, they can take 60, 80, 90, 100 plus weeks to adapt. So this is the trick with learning how to walk straight. It's going to feel a little bit better in the first couple weeks, but it's going to take about a year to start walking straighter, to start being used to walking straighter. And that's one of the big keys of orthotic use. So as we're addressing all these secondary issues with our patients, we have to emphasize to them that even though our nerves, our muscles, and our bone can start to feel better earlier, the ligaments, the tendons, and the cartilage will take a really long time to adapt to these changes. So that's why over a year, you're going to get closer to that 100%. So stay confident in your treatment. Capsulitis. This condition involves inflammation of the ligaments or joints surrounding the ball of the foot. It's often caused by excessive pronation over a prolonged period of time. Pressure, irritation of the capsule of the joint area. The cause, same kind of things, poor fitting shoes, lack of cushion, pressure through the calf, the plantar fascia, the hamstring, you're leaning more into the front of that foot. Abnormal foot biomechanics like a bunion, second toe pain. For me, almost always this is in the second toe. It's extremely common, but sometimes it's in the fourth toe. So for example, the fourth metatarsal, especially in the higher arched foot, the fifth metatarsal and the first metatarsal, they can actually move up and down quite a bit, but the second, third, and fourth metatarsal, they can't really pivot up and down. So that fourth metatarsal with a high arched foot can get some capsulitis. Repetitive activities that put stress on the ball of the foot are very common. One thing that I'm going to include in here, I'm not going to go in depth in this video, but cuboid syndrome in the middle outside of the foot, this could create radiating pain throughout the middle or front of the foot. Something to consider. Cuboid syndrome, there's some easy solutions there, but that could create radiating pain up to the front of the foot. Hammer toe, claw toe, mallet toe. These deformities can affect the joints in the toes, leading to pain and discomfort in the ball of the foot. Muscle imbalances, especially in the foot, such as flat foot, they change the angle of the tendons. So the flexors can get tight, the extensors can get tight, and that creates different types of toe deformities. 
This can make the first metatarsal, second, third, fourth, fifth metatarsal buckle down and the toe buckles up. That puts more pressure on the capsule, that pulls that fat pad back. The biomechanical changes can actually put more pressure in the ball of the foot underneath the second, third, fourth, and fifth metatarsal. This can lead to nerve pain. This can be related to diabetes, arthritis, nerve problems like peripheral neuropathy, gradual changes, inflammation that causes fat pad loss, age. And again, I love to use the ultrasound to take a look right here. With an ultrasound, you can see inflammation of the capsule, of the tendons. Same kind of thing with capsulitis. As you're screening and looking for it, you wanna push on that second metatarsal head, that third metatarsal head. The fourth metatarsal head is actually pretty common. And then under x-ray, you can see is there stress fractures, is there damage? Under ultrasound or MRI, you can actually see discontinuation. This is actually capsulitis or turf toe syndrome of the first toe joint. I didn't have a great image of that second MTPJ, but essentially this, you can compare the second, third, fourth metatarsals against each other, which one's thicker? Where is the pain? And you can measure that thickness. Is there any abnormalities? Is there any discontinuation? Is it getting better over time? You're really just looking for comparison from the left foot compared to the right foot. And then you can also combine it with the plantar fascia. I usually run down the plantar fascia. See, is there any thickening? Because the plantar fascia weaves into that ball of the foot as well. Sometimes it overlaps a little bit. You might have some thicker plantar fascia, not just capsulitis under the second MTPJ. Another cause is gout. Gout can cause sudden severe pain in the ball of the foot. If they wake up and their pain is 10 out of 10, it could be a gout flare up in the big toe joint that's radiating over to the second toe, third toe. This is more in the big toe joint, but this is buildup of uric acid crystals in the joints. If you're concerned about this, you could numb up the area, you could take a joint specimen, you could use the ultrasound to look for gout toe five. Causes of gout. This could be a diet high in purines such as red meat, shellfish, alcohol. And this is someone who's already overweight, sudden weight gain, someone who's not drinking enough water. They ate a lot of inflammatory foods the night before. This can be genetic. This could be related to the kidneys. There could be a family history of gout, but it's more the symptoms that present. At the same time, if it gets better, in the same day and stays away, that could potentially mean that it's gout. You might wanna tap that joint in the future after you numb up the area, of course. Specifically, if you have overpronation, if you're leaning on the inside of your plantar fascia, your big toe joint, it's going to be more inflamed. You're going to have more arch pain. Your first metatarsal joint is going to hurt more. As a result, already having that inflammation will irritate that joint even more. It will create even more inflammation, even more swelling, and as a result, if that fluid's not circulating, the uric acid is much more likely to deposit there. And I usually find that the foot that has ankle joint equinus is the more likely foot to have the gout attack. This happens like 95 plus percent of the time for me. I don't keep exact stats, but I feel like it's almost every single time. So the diagnosis of gout, you wanna look over the medical history. There are joint fluid tests, but again, when it's red hot and sore, you don't wanna do this at the beginning unless you numb up the joint with lidocaine ahead of time. You can do blood tests, so you could order a uric acid test with your basic lab panel. You can do an ultrasound. I've done an ultrasound a few times and you can actually see the gout crystal building up in there. That is something possible to see in an x-ray. On ultrasound, there's something called the double contour sign. Now, I usually compare one foot to the other just to make sure. If you're not looking at these every single day, then it's hard to pick it up because it's so fine. But essentially what happens is along the hyaline cartilage, you see a second line, that's the urate crystals that build up. But secondly, you also get inflammation and swollen fluid. So when you compare it to the other side, you're going to see that the inflamed joint definitely has much more fluid, and then you can try and look for that contour line against the cartilage and the bone. So what I usually like to do is compare the right great toe to the left great toe. You can see the right great toe here is significantly more swollen, has much more swollen joint capsule, and you can kind of see that double contour line. To me, it's not always the most obvious, but, but it gives you an indication to consider gout much more likely. 
And at the same time, if you think it's a fracture or an injury, you could rule that out and make sure there's no ligament rupture as well. Calluses and corns. You can actually see the pressure areas. Calluses, corns, warts. This could create pressure spots, but sometimes I've missed these too. It's important to get in there with your thumb and your fingers and actually palpate. Is there a hard area? Can you actually palpate something thick? Arthritis. There are various forms of arthritis, including Freiberg syndrome in the second metatarsal. You could have stress fractures. You could have osteoarthritis. You could have rheumatoid arthritis, which causes pain and swelling in the ball of the foot. There are a lot of different inflammatory arthritides in the foot. You could have age-related wear and tear leading to osteoarthritis. You could have autoimmune disorders such as rheumatoid or psoriatic arthritis. And then you want to perform a biomechanical exam. Is it a cavus foot type? So a higher foot type is going to put more pressure on the ball of the foot. A flat foot. This increases shear stress onto the ball of the foot. So your foot's moving and rubbing across the front. And it's very important to perform a biomechanical exam. Check the ball of the foot, check the ankle, check the arch, check the hamstring, check the calf, check the hips. This could be something that you could definitely address and take care of, especially if there's weakness. At the very least, that's an easy physical therapy referral and double check on that. So how do we go about diagnosing these ball of the foot conditions? When somebody first comes in, I would check what's going on. Go over their history. What's their day like and what's their needs like? Have they seen other doctors before? If they have, you want to move to more aggressive treatments. If they haven't seen anybody, usually simple, easy stuff can be very effective. So the first thing is, what are they looking for specifically? And then number two, as you go over the history, when did it start? Has it been present for a long time? Has it been ramping up? So for example, if it's been there for a long time and they're older, it could be more osteoarthritis, could be more stiffness, could be just more general irritation, swelling. So you wanna look at capsulitis, plantar fasciitis, metatarsalgia, you wanna palpate that Morton's neuroma nerve, you wanna bend the toes up and down, are they flexible or rigid hammer toes? But on the other hand, if they've seen a lot of doctors, if it can't get better, usually in my opinion, it's still the same issue, but they haven't successfully gotten that pressure off of it. So a lot of the times this is more difficult to treat Morton's neuroma pain, capsulitis pain is very common. You wanna make sure you get an x-ray. Check the actual bone, check if there's a stress fracture. A lot of the times I look at the thickness of the endosteum, so the wall of the bone, check if there's a bone reaction, actually palpate that bone based on that x-ray. Is there an early stress reaction, even if there's not a crack through there? Number two, you want to check that nerve between the toes. Is that where it's hurting? If it's not, it's probably not Morton's neuroma. You probably don't need to scan it at that point. Palpation really highlights whether it's Morton neuroma ahead of time if you're pressing in the right spot. I would say for the vast majority of the patients, unless there's a specific diagnosis popping right out at you, this is a pretty straightforward overload condition and see what they wanna do. Do they want perfectly straight toes through surgery? Do they just want that pain relieved? Are they just going on a trip where they wanna be comfortable for one day? An x-ray will give you a lot of information. When you take an x-ray, sometimes it's a slam dunk. Hey, that's definitely a fracture. But this is really the stress fractures that I see. Take a look at the left-hand side. That's an endosteal reaction with a stress reaction. If you were to do an MRI, look at how much fluid would be within that metatarsal. That's really what it looks like, and you have to check that thickness. Compare the lateral side to the medial side, which side is thicker, palpate with your finger, see if that's the source side. It's a clear explanation. Now for Morton's neuroma, it would be amazing if it actually looked like this on the x-ray, but it doesn't. But things you wanna look out for is check that cortex around the area. There's plenty of times where people are having pain and it's actually that thickened endosteal reaction that's creating the problem, not the actual neuroma itself. Same with the capsulitis. And take a look at the parabola as well. Is the second metatarsal long? Do you have ankle joint equinus, a tight plantar fascia? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that you're gonna have more pressure under that second metatarsal joint capsule at that point. Or if you have a cavus foot type, maybe it's under that fourth metatarsal because you're, you're standing more on the outside of your foot and that fourth metatarsal is not mobile. Check that endosteal reaction. So taking a look at some of these biomechanical issues like long metatarsals, inflexible metatarsals, tight calves, 
tight plantar fascia. Eventually, it can develop arthritis, jamming, Freiburg infarction. So there's a lot of different things that you can correlate to the biomechanics. And then number two is if you can do an ultrasound, that can really tell you is the plantar fascia swollen? Is the joint capsule swollen? Are the flexor or extensor tendons swollen? That can give you a lot of information. And if you're still concerned or if something's not getting better, an MRI might be helpful as well. So if you're concerned about soft tissue issues like a neuroma, I don't think I've ever seen one quite larger than this. This is pretty huge. They're usually pretty small. You look for that swelling more than anything. So what I do is left and right foot. I actually just compare, I actually highlighted the nerve right here, but it's usually kind of around that five millimeter range. I pause it, I highlight it to the patient. It's pretty obvious and you can compare it to the other foot where it's not really there. Same time you can compare it to capsulitis. So this is more of a turf toe injury, but underneath the second metatarsal phalangeal joint, especially if you're correlating it to the x-ray, you can see swelling or some type of disruption to the capsule. You could line it up essentially down the flexor tendons. You can check out the flexor tendons. You can take a look at the bone underlying the flexor tendons for defect. Compare it to the contralateral side for any swelling for any injury. I always run it up and down to the plantar fascia as well. You can check where the plantar fascia is thick. And the beauty is if your x-ray is having a hard time taking a look for a stress fracture, you can actually see the stress fracture. Now that's more of a cortical shell already developing after 21 days, but you will actually see joint fluid. So the stress fracture if it's early, you actually see that fluid within the bone and it makes the diagnosis pretty easy. And when talking with the patients, I find it's very helpful to go over the actual biomechanics. And when you can predict like, hey, because your right foot is tighter, it's gonna be thicker, it's gonna be more irritated, and then it actually shows up on the ultrasound, which it does 99% of the time, then you look like a genius and the patient buys into what you're saying. And as they start to get better, even if the neuroma pain or the capsulitis pain is not better, but you can see that fascia improving and the flexibility improving, they stick with you and they believe what you're saying because you're showing them evidence. And the beauty is when you look at their biomechanical structure, so their foot position, their knee position, how vertical or how horizontally their foot moves, you can predict where a lot of this pressure, where a lot of this soreness will develop for sure. So for example, this person is significantly overpronating. They're going to have a very tight plantar fascia, a lot of pressure on their second, third, and fourth metatarsals. It's more likely to have metatarsalgia pain, and this is predicted and corrected for. What are new exciting treatments? Even though this is the conservative care therapy, I consider these basically in-office treatments now that are considered, so I'll briefly go over them, but minimally invasive metatarsal surgery. So the Minimally Invasive Foot and Ankle Society, they have a board certification now. There are some fun procedures that they can do. And I've done these a lot for diabetic type patients with an ulcer underneath the second toe, but essentially making a small poke on the top and using what's called an Asada drill to cut that bone, it just floats that metatarsal up and right away that ulcer or that pressure spot or that wound can heal relatively quickly and you can get them back into a shoe with a good supportive orthotic pretty quickly. That's a pretty fun technique. I think for the ball of the foot and the big toe joint, joint distraction, arthroscopy, all that kind of stuff, that's more theoretical, not really that effective. But what about a chylectomy? Check if there's like joint spurs, check if there's like a crushed joint, like a Freiburg's infarction in the past. Sometimes a joint spur could be creating pressure. It could be rubbing. I have had this in diabetic type patients where a wound was developing. So something to consider, potentially something minimally invasive could be beneficial here. But a realignment osteotomy, floating those metatarsal heads in a very severe cavus foot type might be an option. But again, if they're a pretty sick patient, even with these smaller procedures, it might just be easier to get them into the hospital, especially if there's a wound or some type of ball of the foot pressure injury or issue. Beyond that, I don't really know of any good procedures that are available in the office. Radio frequency ablation for Morton's neuroma type pain. This technique involves the use of radio waves to produce an electrical current that heats a small area of nerve tissue, decreasing pain signals from that specific area. 
If you have a very resistant Morton aroma, this might be an option. Injections. I'm a huge, huge fan of diagnostic injections. One thing that I've seen a lot of is Morton's neuroma scar tissue, revisional surgery, or even Morton's neuroma or nerve issues. A diagnostic nerve injection, even if you have a little bit of steroid in there, I always tell people if we're concerned about the diagnosis, there's not a ton of risk for even just using a little bit of lidocaine a little bit of steroid with that lidocaine to see if the pain goes away. If we inject the neuroma site and all the pain goes away, we feel pretty confident that it's a neuroma and this is the issue. But if we inject it and the pain's not gone, then it might have been capsulitis that's a referred or just radiating because it's so sore or potentially some peripheral neuropathy if the blood sugar is uncontrolled. But the diagnostic injection just gives you a lot of comfort, especially some patients, they might have a neuroma between the big toe joint and the second toe joint. I've injected these once sometimes and it just goes away and stays away or potentially on the top, the dorsal cutaneous nerve as well. I've had that become an impinged on top of the foot and get a whole lot better with a diagnostic injection. Platelet rich plasma therapy. Is this as beneficial for the ball of the foot? It could be. There are some studies on it. I don't think this one's quite as practical for the ball of the foot, but it can be used. Regenerative medicine techniques like stem cell, stem cell injections, this is possible. The lowest costs that I've been able to find for these are like $1,800. Do I think that this is the best option? It's a decent option, maybe not for this. Corticosteroid injections. These can provide significant relief from inflammation and pain. I think the corticosteroid injection for a lot of these to diagnose them is very effective, especially for Morton's neuroma type pain. Laser therapy. Low level laser therapy can reduce pain and inflammation and promote healing. The MLS laser is pretty good for this. Five to 10 minutes. This by itself will not make all the pain go away, but combining it with good shoes, good orthotics. I'm a huge fan of the laser. It's non-invasive and can be used for a variety of conditions, including the big toe joint, including the plantar fascia, including the arch. Shockwave therapy, this is one of my favorite things to use. This is a non-invasive treatment using sound waves to stimulate healing in injured joint tissue. Shockwave is very well studied for Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, plantar fibromas. I can tell you personally, right away I have a lot of improvement. It's really good for that type of chronic stiff pain. It's not as good for acute or recently injured pain. And where I find using it is effective is for tight plantar fascia, tight Achilles tendon pain, not so much right on the metatarsal or the knuckle, even though on a low strength, you can use it for that. It can be very effective, but loosening up that tight plantar fascia, that tight Achilles tendon is extremely effective. I have a love hate with shockwave therapy. Sometimes it works great. Sometimes it doesn't work and your machine breaks and it costs you a lot of money. But the beauty of the shockwave is it's just another treatment that you can offer inside the office for stiff areas such as scar tissue, plantar fasciitis that's chronic, insertional Achilles tendonitis that's chronic. It can really work well on those areas. And Morton's neuroma, even peripheral neuropathy, what it does do is it essentially creates sound waves that massage that tight, stiff tissue. And there is a biological response. You release certain growth factors like BMP, ENOS, VEGF, which is a vasoendothelial growth factor, which these all lead to neovascularization, improved blood flow, tendon repair, some tissue regeneration. Is it magic? It's not necessarily magic, but if you get pressure off the site, if you protect it, and if it's in the subacute or chronic phase, this can work extremely well. I would not do this on something acute like a sprained ankle or a broken ankle. For ball of the foot pain, what it essentially does is you focus it on that thick area that prevents your windlass mechanism from engaging your plantar fascia from being flexible. And as a result, when you do a few treatments, you don't have to do it regularly, but once a week, every couple of weeks, initially and very quickly, that thickness starts to come down. You can show that to patients on the actual ultrasound. Topical medications. There's a lot of good options of topical gels creams like Voltaren gel can be very effective for a lot of patients and other pain relieving agents can target pain with reduced systemic effects. Supportive shoes. There are definitely undeniable differences between wearing good supportive shoes and the barefoot shoes or barefoot walking. When you're barefoot walking, 
you're leaning forward more, you're taking shorter, more focused steps. So that means you're not taking as wide as steps. In some people, that takes pressure off your hips and your knees. But the trade-off is it puts more pressure on the ball of your foot, your ligaments, your joints, your tendons, which for some older people is not a good idea. So for example, as your muscles, bone, nerve, and fascia adapt and you don't have cushion, you impact and you have zero millimeters of cushion on your shoe. That means if the proper amount of time has not gone by, you're going to develop stress fractures, ligament ruptures, damage, whereas with a shoe, you have eight to 12 millimeters of cushioning. So that means at the beginning, that's easier to get used to, there's less of a transition time. But as that 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 weeks goes by, that's when it might make sense to get used to. Shoes with a wide toe box, good arch support and good cushioning can alleviate pressure on the big toe. There is just so many good different brands out there. For metatarsal pain, I like an eight to 12 millimeter heel lift. I think shoes like Ultra, or zero drop shoes or barefoot shoes are not necessarily the best. But different modifications work for different people, especially with a lot of genetic variability, a lot of biomechanical variability. So take a look at this pressure map in shoes. The left foot is the much tighter foot and look at that red spot. That's exactly where the pressure develops the neuroma. These feet in the middle have it more under the big toe joint pain. So they're gonna have bunion, big toe joint pain. But these two feet on the right, you could see, both balls of the feet have pressure where the neuroma is. And hey, look at this person develops neuroma pain in exactly that spot. Here is a pressure map pre-orthotic on the left-hand side. You can see that big peak. And on the right-hand side is the post-orthotic. So those red peaks in the ball of the foot disappear. I know that orthotic is flipped the wrong way. I had a hard time flipping it and it gave me a headache, but you get, kind of, you get the point of how the metatarsal pad works. It instantly fills that arch and takes pressure off that ball of the foot. That's proven very quickly. A good plan is to start slow. That five, six, seven weeks, don't start with an unsupportive shoe. Start with a good shoe. Otherwise, you're gonna get bone soreness, muscle soreness, fascia soreness right off the bat. Start with a cushioned shoe with a soft, gentle orthotic. You don't need a hard, restrictive orthotic. Get used to it. You can see as 10 weeks, 20 weeks go by, your fascia, your muscles are adjusting. The orthotic is preventing you from rotating, compressing, stretching, and then you could potentially go to a more supportive orthotic as your ligaments, your tendons, and your cartilage get used to it. If that's still not getting used to it, if you're having a hard time adjusting, there's absolutely nothing wrong with using a walk, a cane, ankle braces, knee braces, pre-made orthotics. I'm a huge, huge fan of different types of orthotics with metatarsal padding, especially when you have a frustrated patient who can't take care of the ball, the foot, the arch. A pre-made insole can really smooth things over. There's a lot of great studies about this. And there's a lot of different types of insoles. 3D printed orthotic. You know, I wish this lecture was a little bit later. I actually have a guy flying in from Philadelphia to show me the 3D printed orthotic device. I'm gonna start testing out a bunch of them. But essentially for paying for the plastic that's used to make the orthotic, you can print these in your office within an hour. Otherwise, there's a lot of different types now where you can use an iPad to scan, you can custom mold, you can make different orthotics. It's very beneficial to make a metatarsal pad or a metatarsal bar underneath to get pressure off the toes, the big toe joint, the hammer toes. 3D printers have come a long way. There's a software called Rhinoceros, which lets you design it in about four to five minutes, and then it takes about an hour to print this device. You could do it right in your lobby, right as the patient's waiting. Using just a simple pad, for example, takes you from the right to the left. It's not a ton of improvement, but with a 3D printer, you can make adjustments, you can add more, and then you can put a top layer on there. The 3D printers, I think, are definitely the wave of the future, and I imagine a day where podiatrists each have one in their office that can make properly made orthotics, but that day is coming, but it's not quite there yet. It's still pretty difficult to use. Shoe modifications. Personally, a shoe stretcher like this, I keep one in the office and I show patients. These are really cheap. They're like 10, 15 bucks online. But a lot of times for dress shoes, you use a spray on the leather. You can stretch out the front. You can fit an orthotic in there to get pressure off the ball of the foot. There's a lot of even home hacks that you can do taking some wet newspaper and stuffing it in the front of the shoe. That can make a big difference. 
Or if you have a prosthetics department with shoe modifications, you can have some patients just take their shoes there. This is great to build a relationship with a company for shoes. There's a few different ones out there like this. That could be something worth looking into. Physical therapy. Physical therapy. This can be extremely effective. Personally, I use the same groups and I train them ahead of time, specifically what we want them to do. This is a great option to reach out, especially if you're a young practitioner. Work with certain groups, you can send them specific plans to get pressure off the ball of the foot. They will gladly work with you and it makes you the practitioner look a lot better. And it makes that person reform more people to you because they know you're gonna send it back to them. Anti-inflammatory drugs. Ibuprofen, naproxen, these can help definitely. Steroids. A medrol dose pack, for example, if somebody's going to Florida, this is when I would use this, or a trip, that can make a lot of that pain go away, but it's not something you want to use regularly. Exercises. These can improve the range of motion, strengthen muscles around the joint, and enhance foot mechanics. And your physical therapist can go over that. Or what's popular now, you guys probably should know about this guy, the knees over toes guy. So this is my friend, Ben. I've actually talked to him quite a bit, but he promotes the tibial crusher, anterior tibialis exercises, knees over toes exercises. He's got a couple different books. It's such a simple program. I use this myself and I've had tightness through my hamstrings, my glutes. This has made such a big difference for me, especially addressing ankle joint equinus and strengthening. I used to do a lot of gastrocnemius recessions, but I truly believe that strengthening your anterior tibialis is one of the easiest things you can do. This is like a five minute exercise for the week. This, you can do it with no equipment. You could do it with the tibial crusher. But I really think that that is an option to really reduce the ankle joint equinus rates. You can do a full biomechanical exam and there's great apps. A lot of the times if people are frustrated, you should analyze them. At the very least, do it by watching them walk and writing down what's wrong with them. But there are more advanced treatments like the knees over toes guys. So this is a good friend of mine, but essentially the exercise is squatting forward squatting back with a full extension. The beauty of this is both your strengthening and stretching just about every single muscle in your leg. I do three rounds of this every morning and my knees, hips, and legs have never felt better. And you can do this as well with a slanted board or just up on your toes. I know balance wise at the beginning, it seems tough, but you can hold on to a chair on each side or your counter or a wall, and you don't have to go down all the way. Just start at the beginning and you will gradually get significantly stronger and more flexible, guaranteed. Anterior tibialis. This is such an ignored muscle, even though we as podiatrists should be taking advantage of it. You can do an exercise where your butt goes against the wall and you simply lift your feet up. I have thought that this was a gimmick, but I started doing this. I even bought this anterior tibial crusher and it has made such a difference. It essentially corrected my ankle joint equinus within a couple months. And this is something I thought I was stuck with permanently. I personally have changed my stance. I used to be all about night splints, stretching devices and different devices, but really what we need to promote is dynamic motion, anterior tibialis workouts, knees over toes type rehab, combined with orthotics, combined with a great biomechanical exam. We as podiatrists have a huge opportunity to take advantage of this. Hips, knees, thighs, this could revolutionize getting foot pressure relieved. More practically, looking at that meta-analysis, these things are three times more successful than any type of other conservative treatment. That's why I focus so much on it, even though it does seem like a gimmick. Now back to the orthotics. Orthotics really are the long-term key combined with getting your muscles strong and flexible. It seems impossible, but we as podiatrists, we are the orthotic experts. Let's take this thing back. There's a lot of great ways to do it that have seemed to be abandoned, but you don't have to use foam boxes. These devices are not very effective. I have personally ordered all these things myself. I've used the phone apps. They do not compare to the type of corrections we can do in the office. Like I mean by a mile. The different types of aggressive modifications for metatarsalgia that we can make are unbelievably successful. So at the end of the day, with any type of ball to foot metatrasalgia pain, our whole body impacts it. Our ligaments, our tendons, and our nerves, our muscles can get better quickly. But if that patient leaves after their injection or their therapy or their surgery even, and you don't connect 
the joints upstream, like the bone, the fascia, the ligaments, the tendons, the connective tissue, and the cartilage, you're going to have longer term problems and it probably will come back. You can correct that nerve initially and get that initial pain relief, but then get to the root cause, get that person healthy long term. You can talk to them and explain to them about orthotics, about holding that foot straight, how their knees can get better, how their hips can get better, how everything can start getting better. So thank you so much for having me. 